In our first story, three soldiers and a policeman who were wounded in an ambush said to be by nomadic headsmen have been transferred to the 37th Military Hospital for further treatment. The four who were on admission at the Confanochi Teaching Hospital were being treated for injuries they sustained when they came under fire after responding to a distress call from a farmer who said her farm was being ravaged by cattle owned by the headsmen. Emmanuel Mensa, a trauma and critical nurse at the Presbyterian Hospital at Agogo, where the officers were first sent, describes their condition at the time they were transferred to the Confanochi Teaching Hospital. Yesterday in the evening, around 7 p.m., I know around 6 p.m., we reassessed them and then we realized that one of them who had a shot of the pellet down the throat began, to, uh, began uh, becoming dysnic becoming breathless, cannot breathe, because there was edema forming, <clears throat> sorry. The upper airway was getting obstructed, so he was choking. So we quickly had to rush him to the theater and then intubate him. But the prior decision to refer them had already been sustained, because the other two have a pellet at the base of the skull, which was equally causing CSF to bleed through the ears. So we had to refer. And the other one too was having a pellet by the vertebral column. So it was initially critical that we need to refer both uh, the three of them but the fourth person was lucky he only had a shot of a pellet in the left shoulder uh, which has been dressed this morning unfortunately he's come for review and he's stable that is the commander himself okay uh, b before we, we, we came on there uh, we're discussing the air condition and you said that at that point if you had not taken that decision to react uh, something on top what could have happened what exactly was the danger initially we were thinking of transferring the patient faster but we realized that the ambulance services are not that forth and coming that we could meet a challenge and then we could lose the patient on the way so we, the initial decision was to wait and then hold on a bit just for a few minutes and then see how best the patient will be before transferring just to make sure the patient is stable but unfortunately within 30 minutes prior to taking that uh, after taking that decision the patient began to complain that he was choking that he couldn't swallow saliva which was a danger sign and later we realized that the tongue was coming out, which means that the patient is choking and the breath had become hoarse, <laughs> like someone who is choking. So we quickly have to rush the patient to the theater just to secure the airway. The airway was most important in Aden. So Prince Apia joins us live for an update on the situation there. Uh, hello, Prince. What, what more can you tell us about uh, this issue? Yeah, Israel, I, I can report that as at 12 uh, p.m. when uh, we got to the Confirmatory Teaching Hospital, we were told that the military officials from um, Accra had, had been there to convey the um, injured soldiers from the Confirmatory Teaching Hospital to the 37th Hospital for further treatment. Uh, that's the information we had from the hospital, Israel. All right, but do we know about the situation of these uh, four before they were sent over? Uh, we don't have details of um, the, their conditions before they were sent, but um, information we, 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 we gather is that immediately they were brought in, they were taken care of, you know, immediately, first aid, sort of, before they were transferred to uh, Tech 7 for further treatment. Do we have any updates on the situation back in Agogo? Um, no, not yet. We don't have that. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Prince Apia, bringing us that update. There. Now, the Asante Achim North MP and the Apia Kubi has meanwhile been speaking about how he was offered a 100,000 CD bribe from nomadic headsmen to turn a blind eye to the wanton grazing of cattle, which has led to a security crisis in the Ashanti region town. He told in Shri FM investigative journalist Wahim Interior that he refused the money sent through a district NADMO coordinator to convince the MP and a district chief executive. His comments follow the transfer of the district police commander ASP Samuel Amuzu over his handling of the security crisis that has recorded monthly tragedies and casualties since October 2017. Mr. Pia has been critical of the district commander who he, who he claimed owned cattle in Agogo but hired the nomadic headsmen to rear them on his behalf. That effort yielded the peace that we enjoyed. And we got them to understand that we will be able to live with them if they are able to live 
within the confines of the law. And indeed, we had given them indication that they needed to put the animals in their crowds and dug, dig uh, boreholes for them to have water to drink. And indeed, feed them by uh, hay. When they refused to put the animals in the crowds, we engaged them again. We called them to another meeting and gave them, in fact, in the first occasion, we gave them five months to do that. They didn't do it. So we called them again and gave them two weeks. We have informed the district, uh, the regional, in fact, the divisional commander, he is aware. We have informed him variously and, and the suspect who gave directions. So he is aware of all that has happened in respect of even this arrest. And indeed, we have also complained variously to the divisional commander about the conduct of this guy who we thought and suspected that had been compromised. And indeed, we have given him every information. When you see him, you can tell him that I am one person who shares a lot of security information with them. And indeed, I'm, I have security eyes, so I see what happens. And indeed, today, I'm going to also give further information, security information, to the uh, regional uh, police command for them to be able to investigate uh, you know, the district commander, what he has done and what he hasn't done, so that they'll be able to take a proper decision on him. From, from your stand, it seems you've passed a vote of no confidence in the district police commander. Indeed, we can't take him here. It is in the interest of national security and he himself to leave this uh, district and go and uh, find peace somewhere because uh, he will not be the person to solve our problems. He has, we believe sincerely that he has been compromised and that we have no trust, no confidence in him whatsoever. This appears to be a, a bit some sort of a, a threat to say no, that you, no, can't, no, you no. can't leave, or you, he can't work here. No, no, it is no threat. It is the realities of the times. I'm only just giving you uh, the situation on the ground. Right, so we're joined on the phone line now by Oheming, Tinshire FM's Oheming Tia, who has been speaking there uh, to the district chief executive. Now, Oheming, we understand that indeed a new person has been, uh, a new district police commander has been named. Yes, sir, is right. The new district commander, DSA Joe Apia, uh, took over the affairs of the Agogo District Police Command this afternoon. He was introduced uh, to the district chief executive as well as uh, the MP for the area and some members of the district city council uh, to take over from ASP Samuel Kojo Azugu, uh, who had uh, not used by both the MP and the DCE uh, for what they describe as a compromised stance on the fight against the nomadic herdsmen in Israel. Now, the allegations made against the previous district police commander are quite serious. Has he had a chance to respond to any of them at all? The, the embattled uh, district police commander was not in the community to speak to. Actually, I made several calls to him uh, during my uh, time uh, in Agugo, but unfortunately, uh, he didn't take any of my calls. But later on, when... Uh, Joy uh, FM spoke to him. Uh, he said he was also surprised uh, at the way the issue has been handled. And he said uh, for him, uh, he has not committed a, any offensive uh, act. As far as he is concerned, uh, he thinks that the MP who now are accusing him uh, did not do well, but for him he has been advised uh, not to give further details uh, to the issue, except to say that uh, he will give everything to God because he thinks that he, for the two years that he spent in Agogo, uh, he did very well to bring the situation under control. And this time I'm, I'm referring to the nomadic herdsmen classes, uh, nomadic herdsmen farmer classes in Agogo. Uh, he managed to bring the situation under control, even at the point that the regional uh, police command uh, commended him for an exemplary uh, uh, leadership uh, in Agogo. So he was not expecting the member of parliament uh, who uh, then asked him, uh, because he's not in the book, good books of a DCE, uh, to write uh, an official uh, transfer letter. He, the MP, uh, promised to facilitate that one for him. So he's surprised that uh, this time around he's the one leading the crusade to ensure uh, his exit uh, from office. All right, and how about the nomadic headsmen who were told ambushed the three soldiers and a police officer? Do we have any updates if they're being pursued or if there are any leads on them? Not at all. Israel, the scenario in Agogo is a bit uh, uh, complex 
uh, because we, we are talking about nomadic men whose abode uh, is in the bushes. So even if the police and the military team wants to pursue them, uh, they, they are not in the Agogo township, uh, uh, to be specific, uh, but they are in the bushes, uh, some as far, uh, as far as uh, 40 miles away from the community. And even those areas where they have been operating, they will have some uh, in areas, uh, in other, some areas they are unengineered rules. So if you want to, if you want to pursue them, it becomes a bit cumbersome, a bit difficult uh, for the police military team. What that we were made to understand was that the police and military team will concentrate uh, on their core mandate of protecting life and property in Agugu and ensure that they push the nomadic herdsmen and their cattle from the Agugu land. And don't forget, most of them uh, also uh, uh, operate in the night uh, at the time that uh, owners of the farms or the farmers themselves have gone to sleep. So if you want, if you want to pursue them in the, under the cover of darkness, that becomes a bit difficult uh, for the police and military team. So I'm not too sure that the police and military team will say that we are pursuing uh, those uh, who took part in that act, uh, the suspected act that led to uh, the injury of uh, three uh, military officers, including the commander of the operation, a uh, car leg team in Agogo. He's a military officer. Uh, so it, it's a bit difficult situation, Israel. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Oheming, Terry and Shreya FM's Oheming, to bring us that update. And we're staying with the situation where some residents in the town where the ambush and shooting of the security personnel occurred have been asked to be careful when on their farms and avoid working in isolation. They claim the actions of the Operation Kalek team and their reprisals from the headsmen will affect farming and food production. So let, let, let's find out from some of uh, some residents of Agugu uh, how they have been faring uh, as far as the issue of the nomadic herdsmen uh, is concerned. Now the member of parliament has appealed to farmers in Agugu uh, to refrain from going to their farms until the situation is normalized here in Agugu. The appeal from the member of parliament, it is keeping us in some kind of fear. So right now I have some technicals in the Afram Plains. I have not been able to be in my farm for about three days now. You have to go to the farms and then cultivate our plantain. You know, we are in the plantain cultivation period. And so the MP saying this, like I said earlier, is keeping us in some fear. But maybe if it's because of security issues that he is appealing to us that we shouldn't, we shouldn't go to our farms for now. So I think we'll heed to that advice and then look out for the authorities finally bringing the situation under control so that we can go to our farms without fear. Uh, Oh, okay. Uh, so what uh, uh, she's telling me is, is that, yes, uh, she will uh, uh, agree. She will agree and then uh, uh, accept the fact that, uh, the accept the plea from the MP that farmers should remain at home. Somebody here, I don't buy. I said, we don't want to 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 buy. According to her, normally for the farmers in Agogo, if you want to sell your produce, especially with regards to plantain, you go to the farm on Monday to uh, harvest them. So by Tuesday, you cut them uh, to the market centers. As been done here. Uh, so uh, this plant, uh, this plantain you see here, were cultivated and were uh, harvested yesterday. So definitely it's going to affect uh, their business. Meanwhile, Minister of the Interior Ambrose Derry has blamed the Libyan situation and other continental issues for the proliferation of arms in the sub region. A development, he says, allows nomadic headsmen to illegally acquire and use sophisticated weapons on farmers who resist attempts by the herdsmen to turn their farmlands into grazing grounds. The destruction of farmlands by the herdsmen and their cattle has been at the center of violent and sometimes deadly confrontations, the latest being the Agogo ambush that has left four security personnel injured. Ms. Derry has given the strongest indication yet on how to root out the unlawful grazing and assured that government is currently working out a permanent solution to the impasse. It's not as if the whole year it was a problem. One of them was because we had also deployed a number of police personnel there. So I believe that this recent one is an explosion and we need to deal with it.
the relative peace you mentioned here will be challenged by some quarters. Because on our channel, we, we aired a documentary that specifically dealt with the issue of headsmen. And for the greater part of last year, they kept attacking, attacking, attacking the people of Agogo and its environs. Well, I believe say relative peace. No. I, I, want, I want to tell you one thing. They, they, yes, they were, they were not attacking one area alone. It wasn't just Agogo. There were other areas that were attacked. Yeah. And what I'm telling you is that when we were dealing with those other areas, we were referring to Agogo as a good example. Okay. But having said that, we are, that's what I told you. It's not a problem that's going to go away, but it's a problem that we're going to work on and make sure that we bring under control. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's ongoing and we are going to have to, to deal with it. You know, already there is move to beef up security, not, I mean, really high, but going forward, do we expect to see more of that? Yes, we expect to see uh, some action taken, but there's a limit to what I can say about security. Mm -hmm. I'm not about to tell people the exact moves we're going to make, but suffice it to say that we are going to enhance the, 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 the participation and the effectiveness of the security forces going forward. Let's look at the issue of arms. One of the key issues which has given these nomadic headsmen the confidence to go out there and perpetrate crime has to do with the fact that they can acquire sophisticated weapons and shoot at, I mean, innocent people. How concerned is your ministry that these individuals easily get access to some of these guns, most of which are unregistered, if you like, yeah. and unlicensed? Thank you very much. Yes, we are concerned. And we have the Commission on Small Arms, which is working, trying to move towards marking uh, arms. But generally, yes, uh, you would hear that we've made certain arrests in certain parts of the country mm. where people have arms and therefore they, they, they were not registered and they were taken. And you do know that even in cases where our own pers personnel, as in Bolgatanga, were selling out some of state arms, we are taking steps to make sure. It's a regrettable situation. We believe that it has continental uh, uh, um, dimension, that in Libya, because of the failed state in Libya, there's proliferation of arms all over the place. But we are working within our... You're watching Joining Us Prime, we're taking a break, but still ahead in the bulletin. Accra High Court is sitting Tuesdays and Thursdays as Attorney General pushes for speedy trial. In a case of collapsing financial loss to the state brought against former NTA Director General in four hours. In pockets of misunderstanding between traders and Accra Metropolitan Assembly Task Force as the Assembly continues to maintain a presence on the streets a day after its latest deconjection exercise. Commuters are however happy with the free flow of human and vehicle traffic in the city. Stay tuned, we'll be back later. AMA has done a beautiful job. Mm. This thing should have been done long, long ago. I am asking them to sustain it. Okay. I'm asking them, no matter how people will see. And Accra High Court has set Tuesdays and Thursdays each week to hear the case involving former Director General of the National Communications Authority, William Matthew Tevy, and four others who have been charged with causing financial loss to the state. This was after the Attorney General Gloria Kufu prayed the court to hear the case expeditiously. Though lawyers for the five accused raised concerns about the unavailability of their clients on some of the days, Justice Eric Cheba for settled on the two days as a compromise for both parties. Joining us is Joseph Akable has the rest of the story. The seven-member state legal team is led by Attorney General Gloria Kufu and Director of Public Prosecution Yvonne Atakra Obobisa. The AG read the charges against two of the accused persons, William Matthew Tete Tevi, a former Director General of the NCA, and Nana Ousu and Sawe, a board member. They both pleaded not guilty and were granted bail to the tune of $1 million with three sureties. And these were the same conditions that were granted the three others who were put before the court in December 2017. So the legal banter between lawyers on both sides started after the Attorney General had informed the court that as he would have preferred, if it were possible, for court hearings to be held 
on daily basis from Monday to Friday. Uh, two objections were raised. The first was to the effect that one of the accused persons, uh, Mr. William Tevi, the former CEO of the National Communications Authority, uh, they said that he was receiving treatment that required him to attend to the hospital twice, uh, three times a week. Uh, so that made it impossible for him to attend to the court on all the five days. The other concern uh, was that they had requested that the Attorney General furnishes them with all relevant questions that uh, he, she intends to rely on in the prosecution of the case. She agreed with the second request, but with regards to the first request, she asked that the court uh, decides appropriately on what will be done. Uh, Justice Eric Chaber for director that Tuesdays and Thursdays will be the fixed dates for hearing of the matter, starting from 16th of January 2018. Uh, the Attorney General engaging the press after the close of proceedings, replied her critics who have raised concerns about the fact that uh, she could have waited for the Office of the Special Prosecutor to be formally set up before starting with prosecution of this matter. I thought the accusation has been that we are not prosecuting because we are waiting for the Office of the Special Prosecutor. So why, I can never get it right. I come to court, the problem is that why don't you wait for the Special Prosecutor? And now that I am in court, you are asking me why I shouldn't wait for a special You are not coming to court. They say, why is, are you not coming to court? You are waiting for the special prosecutor. I think that I should th take this opportunity to explain. The cases we run in our office depend, is not started merely because a docket has been submitted to the office. I think the expression that the investigators always use is that we have submitted the docket to the office of the Attorney General for advice. This is because investigations involve largely the gathering of evidence. For purposes of evaluation for prosecution, the Attorney General will have to study a docket and determine whether what is on the docket will warrant a prosecution. That at least will require an accused person to be called upon to answer. That is what it's been about. It has never been the case that cases are not coming to court because we are waiting for the office of the special prosecutor. That is a perception which is wrong and which I want to disabuse. And for that reason, therefore, we have not waited for the establishment of the office of the special prosecutor to bring this matter to court. Come 16th January 2018, the state will be expected to present its first witness to the court. And the second hearing will take place the Thursday of that very week as well. Reporting for joining us from the High Court, my name is Joseph Akable. We're taking a break here on Join News Prime to bring you business news, but still ahead in the bulletin, former President John Ejekunku for his praise Zoom Lion founder, Joseph Sian J. Paul, as one of the most innovative entrepreneurs Ghana has had in recent times. Bye. Zoom Lion started looking around and seeing that there was so much filth around us. Earlier times, we depended on the um, local government assemblies. Unfortunately, the conservancy workers would come around and just work superficially. So this man comes around, he organizes, employs a lot of people, and now Zoom Lion is a household name. Well, the Central Regional Minister is also coming up with a solution for girls in the Upper Dentra East Municipality who are an age-old taboo against crossing the river thing during the menses. This is keeping them away from school. Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. For as long as your cycle uh, goes on, you cannot go to school. What, what is that? We hear what the solution is. Business News is up next. The Accra Metropolitan Assembly has coming for praise for its latest decongestion exercise, which has resulted in a significant improvement in human and vehicle traffic in the city. Commuters join you spoke to on Tuesday and encouraged the Assembly not to relent in its quest to keep the traders at bay. Some of the traders, however, say they have been harassed by members of the AMA task force, even though they are complying with the directive not to sell beyond the demarcated line on the pavement. Join us as Maxwell Agbagba caught up with some of them on Tuesday morning at Mokola, a day after the latest decongestion exercise. Some hours after the Accra Metropolitan Assembly, the town 
to um, South Hawkers um, of the pedestrian um, walkway and then off the streets of Accra here at the new plan um, terminal. Well, it looks like some work has actually been done because this walkway has been cleared um, of hawkers who usually um, do business right here. Some of them sell mobile phones, um, some of them sell tomatoes, I mean all kinds of words. If you come here on a normal day, it's actually a one-stop shop where you can buy everything that you need walkway. But to this conspicuous limit, it has done a beautiful job. Mm. This thing should have been done long I want to politicize everything. Politics, politics, politics. But when you use the politics, do all things. I mean, our, our capital will look beautiful. I am asking them to sustain it. Okay. I'm asking them, no matter how people will say. If there is so much load here, sometimes steal some phone, they, they steal a bag, oh, okay. they do a lot of things here. But now that the road is free, you, cannot, you can walk the way you want and nobody will harass you. You know, when you come here um, to the central business district, this part of town actually, um, usually what you'd observe, um, the traders um, take over both shoulders of the road. So exact where I'm standing right now and then the other side, making it very, you know, causing some sort of inconvenience for um, vehicles and people who are in the central business district. But today when you come here, the road is cleared just like you observe at um, the new plant station at Seco. A lot of the traders are not selling on the streets today. Um, many of them are behind um, the walkway that is here. In Yabi, Onupai, not a level of time. After my Sabena, Atashia, in your Nupai, a level three hundred. She says she has children in level 300 and level 400, and she has to cater for them. She has to pay their fees, yeah. and times are difficult yeah. for her. They are behind a red line right now, but this AMA um, official here is trying to get them to move away from this area. Let's see the red line here. They are behind the red line. So why are you sucking them? No red line. Okay, well, she says, uh, he says they are not working with the red line. Where they are, it's and she to get them away from this place. They are not working with a red line, so uh, they are trying to get them away from this place. Hmm. Uh, okay, red line in the red line He's insisting. He's, he's insisting. Okay. He's insisting that they leave this place. And the sellers here are also saying and that they are behind the red line and they do not understand why he should sack them from this place. Essentially, what she's saying that she has two children, one in Zio, another one also in another school. She's the only one who gets a school. She's the brain of a family. And now that she's been sacked from this place, she really doesn't know what she's going to do to pay their school fees. Former President John Ejikum Kufu has praised Zoom Lion founder Joseph Sinha Jepong as one of the most innovative entrepreneurs Ghana has had in recent times. His commendation follows similar compliments paid the Jospong Group chairman by President Kufuado, which many described as inappropriate, considering he has been investigated for corruption by the state. Former President Kufuor, who was speaking at his outdooring as chairman of the Ghana Job Bank Initiative, says much as he believes the law must deal with any criminality that is established, he is convinced the entrepreneurial skills of the Jospon boss are worth emulating. Nancy Emifajradozi has more. Former President Kufuor spoke highly of the Jospon CEO. Talk about Zoom Lion. Zoom Lion started looking around and seeing that there was so much filth around us. Earlier times, we depended on the um, local government assemblies. Uh, unfortunately, the conservancy workers would come around and just work superficially. So this man comes around, he organizes 
employs a lot of people, and now is a household name. Uh, saying this is not saying uh, we are blind to some of the drawbacks. No. The law should be there to deal with people who really go astray. We are a nation or a government now of rule of law. So the law should handle it. But we are talking of creativity, of industry, of wealth, of employment. The former statesman also predicted that the future is not looking bright. If the seeming unemployment situation be devil in the country, it suggests that it is important for the public sector to build a solid foundation for the private sector to thrive. Get a situation like we are in now, where there are so many of them unemployed, then if you are really concerned as a citizen, uh, let alone as a, a, a human being, then the future may not be too bad uh, unless there's a solution to the unemployment situation. You believe in yourself, the youth of Ghana, that you can do it. Uh, unfortunately, it seems like we've been winning as a society, everybody looking up to government. If we go that way, I'm afraid it will take uh, umpteen years before we get there. The public sector can only be the infrastructure for the private sector. Member of the Ghana Job Bank, Godwin Atiga, explains the project is aimed at addressing issues of unemployment in the country. The two tiered system, uh, we have the Ghana Smart Youth and the Ghana uh, Business Incubator System. The Business Incubator aims to employ youth and also give skills in the lean startup process. Now, the big part of this program is actually our business uh, Smart Youth Program. So the Smart Youth Program is actually giving the youth the digital skills to actually lead the new frontier. Though expected to be a people initiative, the group is yet to announce which public institution it will be working with. Former President Rawlings is blaming the lack of potable water to many rural communities in the country on the failure of Ghanaians to protect the environment despite the social and economic benefits we derive from it. Non-governmental organization Water for Rural Africa says Ghana faces an imminent water crisis as a result of industrial and commercial activities that pollute the environment and water sources. President of the NGO, Dr. Donald Agumenu, said this when the group paid a ketsy call on former President Rawlings ahead of the launch of a water project next week. And as Menu filed the following report. The project also aims at helping government achieve goal six of the Sustainable Development Goals, which is to ensure access to water and sanitation for all. Dr. Donald Agumenu is therefore urging government to take steps to address the situation. The issue is uh, beyond destroying the water bodies, what is the, the strategy for water security as far as these communities are concerned because we should have a strategic plan in place to provide water for these surrounding communities within this Galamse environment. Ghana is, is, is part of an oil producing or group of oil producing countries. Trust me, in no time you, you begin to see issues of uh, oil spillage and other things, the destruction of water bodies. And at the end of the day, uh, drinking or security for safe water or water security in short will become an issue that this country will face. So this is the time for us as a country, this is a time for us as a continent to put in the necessary policy framework to be able to mitigate foreseeable crises or challenges that would emerge. The NGO hopes to build 1,000 boreholes in selected rural communities across the country this year. It's Former wonderful. President Rollins, who received the NGO, is blaming the lack of potable water to many rural communities in the country on the failure of Ghanaians to protect the environment despite the social and economic benefits we derive from it. When you look at the technological advancement The number of churches, you know, all in the name of God and goodness and the goodness of God. 
And uh, we still find people so so badly impoverished that they, they still cannot drink clean water. I think it's a serious indictment on us. It's, um, I see it as a reflection of that selfishness in humanity or in some of us, our greed. He also blames the educational system for failing to address this issue. The abuse of the environment, etc. I remember I would very often be traveling on a road and uh, would be crossing so many bridges and I'd be wondering, but where's the water? We're crossing bridges. We've so much abused, so badly abused the environment that a lot of our streams have just dried up, you know? And yet we have so many more educational institutions, universities, and yet our grandparents, our parents, who didn't have so many universities, conducted themselves in a more, much more responsible way. And as to for John News. Residents of Bihi Nayeli, a farming community in the Sabalugu Nanto municipality, are drinking clean water for the first time in their community. This follows a joint news story highlighting the plight of rural women in that area who travel long distances in search of water while competing with animals. Following that story, the Member of Parliament for Sabalugu, Abdul Samed Gunu, initiated an emergency water project to extend pipe borne water to the community. Correspondent Hashmin Mohammed reports. It was all joy as the people of Benayili converged at the chief palace to sing in appreciation of the inauguration of the water project by the member of parliament for Savilugu, Abdul Somed Gunu. Before the inauguration of the water project, the people of Benayili were drinking from contaminated sources, competing with animals to make them sick. But today, the people say, if indeed clean water is life, they believe they will now look healthy and express their gratitude to Joy News and the MP for the area. I thank Joy News, Joy, Joy people for, uh, for uh, a lot of uh, things they have helped us for our water. We was drinking water with animals, and now we had uh, we had uh, through uh, distance drinking a bad water through animals. Joyce News have come with a uh, distant the honorable members and now these days we have a pipe water. Member of Parliament for Savlugu, Abdul Somed Gunu, said he remains committed to attending to the needs of his constituents. We shall ensure that all the communities along the main route here will extend the water system to those communities. And I would like to assure you that the gov government of the new patriotic party led by His Excellency Nana Dudanko Akufado, will ensure that all the promises that we made, such as one village, one dam, one district, one factory, it will all come on board, so that we will have all year round farming. And I also, in collaboration with the, the Honorable MC, we will put our head to, heads together to be able to get a basic school for the Nayib community. For Joy News, Hashmin Mohammed reports from Benayili. Central Regional Minister Kwamina Duncan is liaising with the Shanti region counterpart to build a school for girls in the Upper Daintra East municipality, where an age old taboo against crossing the Fing River during the menses is keeping them away from school. The girls, according to a circuit supervisor in the municipality, are also forbidding from crossing the river on Tuesdays, making them miss classes for half of the 60 days of the school term. Richard Kujunyaku, who has been to the community, reports that consequences of breaking the taboo are serious, as there are many living examples in the town. The reason why building a school that will not take them across the river appears to be the most viable option for now. 
Apart from the girl child forbidding to cross the river of Finn on Tuesdays, they are unable to cross the river for the entire duration of their menstrual periods. The limitations supposedly placed on the girls and women by the river gods is adversely affecting the performance of girls in the basic education certificate examination in the region. At a meeting held under the auspices of the Central Regional Minister to coordinate and evaluate the performances of public basic schools in the region and to analyze the problems leading Leading to their decline in education in the region, the Upper Dintra East Amor for Seki's provider of education, Prince Evans Aqua, sought to know what the education authority and the Central Regional Coordinating Council were doing to resolve the problem. The revelation by the Seki's provider, according to the Central Regional Minister, shook him with fright and disbelief. You have no choice at all as a girl. You have no hand in it at all. If you were a girl and uh, you were uh, you were menstruating for say five days. And it started, say, Monday. So Monday, no school for you. Tuesday, no school. Ah, for Tuesday, it's a double thing. So it means that your message is there, that is one. And then the bar on you, because it's a Tuesday, is also there. And then uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. For as long as your cycle uh, goes on, you cannot go to school. Well, what is that? How can we grow a community, grow a society this way? OK? It's a, I'm sure a river god. That would want to have the best for the people uh, as a god itself. I cannot see how a river god would rather be that discriminatory. An outraged Central Regional Minister Kwame Nadankan says his outfit is going to tackle the issues head on to ensure that a girl child is not discriminated against. For him, since such girls cross the river of him from the Ashanti region to the central region to go to school, he will touch base with the Ashanti Regional Minister in a collaboration to get schools built for such communities with the immediate effects. I'm sure this has not come to the Ashanti Regional Minister's uh, attention. So we pass it to him so that he will also do the inquiries and get the DC for that area. Uh, possibly the need to get a school so that it will not require that the girls cross and that on Tuesdays they cannot cross and also when they are in their menses they cannot cross. That is what uh, uh, we are going to do and today, tomorrow, we will get in touch with the regional minister Ashanti region and pass this piece of information to him. The River of Finn serves a boundary between the Ashanti and the Central Regions and many children from the Ashanti region, especially those in the settler communities, cross the river to attend school at Chichire in the Central Region. The tradition that debars girls from crossing the river has been reinforced by the fact that accidents occurred in the past involving women who tried to defy the river god. In 2004, Hundreds of women voters in villages beyond the river of Finn in the Upper Dintra constituency could not take part in the by-election because of the taboo that bars women from crossing the river on Tuesdays. Richard Kwejonyakon, Joy News, Keep Coast. Right time now for a quick look at our top stories here on Joy News Prime. Three soldiers and a police officer wounded in ambush by suspected nomadic airmen transferred to the 37 military hospital in Accra. Accra High Court will sit on Tuesdays and Thursdays as the Attorney General pushes for speedy trial in a case of causing financial loss to the state but against former NCA Director General and four others. There have been pockets of misunderstanding between traders and the Accra Metropolitan Assembly Task Force as the Assembly continues to maintain a presence on the streets a day after its latest decongestion exercise. Commuters are, however, happy with the free flow of human and vehicular traffic. In business, Ghana Real Estate Development Association Greater paints a gloomy picture of the housing deficit in the country and laments government's way of handling the housing sector's challenge.